This podcast is sponsored by QCon AI, the applied AI conference for software developers. Focusing on the practices of artificial intelligence and machine learning, QCon AI takes a different tack than most other major software conferences in the AI ML space today. Rather than focusing on data scientists, QCon AI targets how full stack software engineers can apply machine learning and AI techniques in their day-to-day roles. QCon AI takes place in San Francisco, April 9th through 11th, 2018. You can find out more about the conference online at qcon.ai. Welcome to the InfoQ podcast, a software engineering podcast from the people behind InfoQ.com. I'm Charles Humble, InfoQ's editor-in-chief, and I'm joined today by Eric Horsney. Eric was a founding team member at Internet Way, which was a French B2B company. He then founded Radians, which was a global finance cloud, which he sold to BT. And he is now the CEO of StreamData.io. He has a background in high-frequency trading. He spoke at QCon London a couple of weeks ago on my track, and I very much enjoyed his talk, and I'm thrilled that he's come along to do a podcast with us. So, Eric, welcome to the InfoQ podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Charles, and uh, hello, everybody. So tell me about StreamData.io. What was it built for and who are your customers? So it was built for developers that were facing the issue of having to present real-time data to applications and uh, web clients, especially in the trading area. Um, And our customers are typically uh, banks, uh, brokers, and uh, API providers. We... um, we, we provide a proxy as a service, and we listen to APIs, and we turn those APIs into uh, event-driven uh, data feeds. So were you building the product for banks and brokers initially? Was that the original idea? Those customers, yes, right away. And actually, we built the, the product for them, uh, and they were our early adopters. Um, we actually were suffering when working with some of them integrating uh, external data feeds. We were suffering from the um, challenge of presenting dynamic data onto applications, and we built the product to actually relieve our own pain. Uh, so that was expected. Uh, the, the, the latest development were not expected. So who is that? Sort of hedge funds and people like that? Exactly. Uh, what, what's happened last year is that we've seen uh, hedge funds and uh, servers of uh, artificial intelligence companies using our service to uh, listen to APIs that we wouldn't have thought about. And that's um, the main motivation why um, I, I came to London to, um, to, uh, to, talk, uh, to talk about what was going on right now in hedge funds. Okay, so the the hedge funds have been using, I'm not sure if it's AI as such, but they've been using mathematicals of various kinds for a a long time. I mean, since the early 1980s, I guess. I think in your talk, you mentioned Renaissance Technologies, for example, who've been specialists in sort of systemic quantitative trading for for some time. Um, So uh, it's not overly surprising in a way, but I guess the sort of AI part of that feels quite new, or at least it does to me. Is that a reasonable summary? Artificial intelligence in itself is a pretty old concept, and uh, and finance has been using it for a while, some better than others. And and I would tend to think that Renaissance technologies have always been the best in that area, Um, and that's because of their choice of hiring mathematics and physicians background rather than financial backgrounds. Um, so that was not at, the, at their beginning uh, deep learning and because uh, those concepts didn't exist, but the concepts uh, they used from the beginning based on the kind of people they hired um, was definitely artificial intelligence to make sense out of the market. Uh, and that was 40 years ago. Now, what I think has changed um, is the evolution in uh, and maturation of artificial intelligence with deep learning, uh, with a systematic and uh, professional or um, very deep way of applying artificial intelligence to um, uh, markets and to um, systems in general. 
uh, I think a lot of those progress were made for uh, weather forecasts. You know, the weather forecast um, has improved a lot over the past 20 years. Um, it's it's not yet perfect, but uh, we can tell that it's definitely on the seven year on the seven day forecast way better than it used to be 20 years ago. So on that basis and uh, also for linguistic and uh, image recognition, a lot of progress have been made thanks to um, Google, Facebook, and uh, others investing a lot on uh, making progress there. Right. So, I'm um, with in terms of the hedge funds, we're presumably talking about sort of neural networks and deep learning being applied now to that field as well. If I've if I've got that correct. Yes. Exactly. The, the frameworks and uh, recipes that have been created for, um, uh, for weather forecast and other day-to-day -day activities uh, uh, can be used for uh, financial decision making uh, on, in the market. So uh, you can actually represent the market the same way you represent a planet. So you put a, you take the planet Earth and you divide it by in cubes of 10 kilometers to uh, to build a model and and build a weather forecasting model. That's the way it works. You can pretty much do the same thing with the economy and um, add some some um, equations that are different, but um, ultimately um, get to a prediction on the same basis. Great. Okay. Thank you. So let's try and unpack that a little bit. If we're training a neural network for a trading system, what are the kind of techniques that you're using to do that training? Um, so it depends on the time horizon you give yourself for your strategy. Um, if you have a, let's say, a one hour uh, time horizon, then you can pretty much use all the techniques of deep learning. Um, and that comes with things that have made huge progress in, uh, in neural networks. Uh, based on uh, gradient descent, like backpropagation. Um, and, and these are techniques that come with um, uh, some, some recipes and, and some discipline like uh, uh, learning, testing, and validating. This is, uh, this is the classic deep learning uh, use uh, when you can make decisions every hour because it takes quite some time to consume lots of data. And the more data you consume, the better is going to be your prediction. Now, if you want to have an impact on the market uh, every minute or every second, these models are uh, more difficult to apply. Okay. So in data science and AI, generally, there's a very common problem with overfitting. And I'm imagining that you can have the same problem with a with a neural net that you've trained in the sense that the market changes or can change very quickly. So this is a classic switching from bullish to bearish type thing that can happen unexpectedly quickly. Is that a significant problem in this context? If you if you've trained your model say with a bullish data set and then the market switches on you? Yeah, um, and that's the the main reason why there are limitations in using. Um, deep and broad um, data sets uh, to, uh, to make your decision because if you make a decision and the market has changed mood, then uh, you're going to make wrong decisions. So if we think about your machine learning as a brain, if you train the brain of your um, machine with a data set that came from a market that was bullish, then the brain will learn that when market moves up, it is a smart thing to, to, to have a look at it and probably um, invest before others so that you want to follow momentum this way and anticipate momentum. Then if you start having this brain uh, applying the same logic to a market that has turned in just one hour into a bearish market on some of the instruments that uh, the brain has decided to uh, trade upon, then you're going to be uh, hitting some failure. Because? Because the, the, the brain will start uh, over-investing in the market that's, been, that's become scarce and where it, it is very risky with lots of embouches. So you don't want to do that. 
and, and vice versa. If you've trained your brain in a very uh, tough uh, market where it is uh, there's a lot of risk and you don't want to uh, take any of it and you you um, you have to wait uh, a lot before taking positions because uh, you don't really know where you stand in terms of a, a landscape. It's a gloomy area. Then when market turns into bearish, um, you're not going to invest enough and you will be beyond behind everybody else. So that's uh, that's the a classic issue with overfitting. Uh, it's when you've trained the brain to something that was um, uh, specific to some time and some environment and the, the brain got uh, fit to that environment so much that it was it cannot be performant to another environment. So how do you avoid that? So typically in uh, AI, what you do to avoid that is to introduce some um, some noise in the um, in the in the test of in, in the test data set that you put into your machine learning. Um, so that's one way of doing it. When you but the issue when you introduce noise is that you 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 end up having a brain that um, may not be fit for any market. The other thing that I find interesting about this is is that the traditional way of training models is quite time-consuming and slow, or at least I think of it as being quite time-consuming. So you take a data set and essentially you're doing a kind of batch training exercise and then you're trying to test and validate that before you put it live. And it's surprising to me that that sort of approach would work in a financial situation because the market can switch and change relatively quickly. Is that a problem? And if so, are there different ways that you can train models that, that maybe I'm not familiar with? Yes, there is a different way. A uh, different way is to have the, the model be trained on the subset of data uh, with uh, a time horizon and a, a, a window that actually evolves um, based on, on the, the time you're targeting, time horizon you're targeting. And the, the model will be able to adapt to the market uh, and make decisions very quickly on the fly. So that's called streaming. That's data stream algorithms. And that's the, the one we presented with Albert uh, uh, of the uh, MOA or SAMOA from um, Apache. Um, so that's one way. But again, if you if your machine learning and your investment strategy is long term or okay with uh, making a, a decision once a day, then then that's uh, that's an issue you have. It's I think the issue only comes when you start get, uh, getting into strategies uh, where you're pretty close to the market and you want to leverage momentum. That makes total sense. Thank you. So I want to change tack a little bit now. Um, and given your background in high frequency trading, HFT, I wanted to talk a little bit about that as well. So could you maybe start by describing the buy side industry for people who aren't familiar with it? Um, the buy side industry is the uh, the group of companies that everybody know, like Vanguard, T. Rowe Price, uh, Fidelity, Cap Group, BlackRock, um, who actually take money uh, from people and invest it on the long term, so that people can actually draw that money when they retire. Uh, it's a huge industry. It's in in the U.S. It's uh, three year of GDP of the U.S. Uh, One hundred trillion dollars. Um, so a lot, a lot of money and long-term investments. And the, the other side of that, I think, again, a lot of people's mental model is kind of, you know, from old films and things of traders sort of standing there shouting at each other across the trading floor. And, and mm. it's presumably mostly algorithms at this point. Is that, that right? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, the human uh, trader is an exception in the market now. Right. And then the second thing that we had was the rise of electronic exchanges. So I'm thinking of people like Brute and so on that were part of that set of regulatory changes that we had, the, the, the Cambian explosion, so-called. Um, can you talk a little bit about that as well? Yeah. So um, in the U.S. between 98 and, and uh, 2005, we had a, 
an explosion of regulation as well with uh, regulation ATS, regulation NMS um, to actually open the market uh, to let the opportunity for new players to come in and uh, make the market more efficient electronically. So the the new players were called ECNs like INET, Brute, uh, and then BATS uh, or Archipelago. And um, that led for uh, the, the, the traders, uh, or let's say the sell side, well, typically companies that service the buy side, uh, that led for them to have to connect to all of these and make the right decisions based on the existence of um, this, uh, all these markets. So they, instead of having to work with two, three markets, they had to work with 12. Right. And you were mainly working on the kind of infrastructure side of this, correct? Yeah. You weren't writing algorithms so much, but you were dealing no. with the infrastructure side. So if HFT is mainly about reducing latency, what are the things that you can do from an infrastructure point of view to reduce latency? The Well, yeah, yeah, you can work with the uh, all the elements of uh, what makes latency. Uh, one is the propagation time, which is the time it takes for the light to go from one point to another. Um, and that depends on the distance, also depends on the density of the medium you use. Uh, another element is the uh, serialization, which is the time it takes for a data packet to be put on the medium. Uh, and to play with this, it's just a matter of uh, using big pipes. If you if you have a one gig pipe, it's going to be uh, 1,000 times faster than putting data on one meg pipe. Uh, and finally, the there is an, a, a third element of latency that is uh, processing time. Anytime you have a, an equipment that is active, that is uh, listening to the data and and then routing it or uh, filtering it or repeating it. Uh, it will take latency. So the, as long as you can remove equipment, uh, you're going to be faster. Okay, so let's go into each of those in turn then. So you mentioned propagation first, which is either locating yourself closer to the exchange or things like dark fiber, I guess, would be in there and straight fiber as well. Can you talk about those a bit? So on the, uh, well, th that one... Uh, uh, what, what we saw happening in the in the year 2000 uh, was that companies uh, would start first uh, getting as close as possible to exchanges, and that's why they wanted uh, for my previous company Radiance to um, to host them. And then uh, they started to ask for dark fiber, which was a way for them to. Um, to connect directly from one point to another with a minimal distance in terms of a, a fiber circuit between two points. Um, so it was a straight fiber to win like, for example, three milliseconds between Chicago and New York. And the, the funny part I think is um, after those trenches were built for uh, the direct Chicago, New York, um, some guys came in with a very smart idea of using old radio waves uh, towers uh, to actually leverage the density of uh, air that is um, lower than the, the density of uh, glass so that the, the speed of light in, in the air is 40% 40, 40 better and faster and they could win another three milliseconds so that the, the trenches were no longer the best thing to do, even though millions had been uh, spent into them. So coming back to all, you know, radio waves was actually the, the smarter move to uh, to be faster than others. <laughs> oh, it's amazing, actually, isn't it? It's just the idea that you could you can kind of switch the medium and gain another three or four milliseconds is kind of astonishing to me. It is. And then in term, you mentioned serialization as well. So what kind of things are people playing with in, in terms of speeding that aspect up? So that, that one is uh, the usual um, uh, size of the pipe you use between one point and another. So if you, if you go from, uh, uh, so at that time, people, I mean, let's say the, the typical media was a 10 meg, and then uh, then it went into 100 meg, or with ATM, 155 meg. Um, 
if you go from a 100 meg to a 1 gig or 10 gig, then you you uh, can reduce your latency by a few milliseconds as well. Right. Yep. Okay. And then the, the third aspect that you talked about was processing, which seems to be quite, there's quite a battleground going on, I think, at the moment with FPGA and the like. Yeah. The, the processing is... Uh, like uh, very well understood to uh, all developers. Um, uh, there are two, th two things. The first thing is to avoid to cross equipment. So you, it's equipment avoidance by, uh, by going direct from one point to another. And the second thing is whenever you actually need to heat an equipment, like a feed handler, that is an equipment that's going to be used to, uh, to try to, uh, uh, translate the exchange feed into something that your algo can can reuse. Um, you can actually accelerate that processing time by um, building dedicated circuit for for your feed. So you have companies like uh, Nova Sparks today that are very good at creating circuits dedicated to feed handlers um, that will you know give you a, a, a few nanoseconds or microseconds advantage against your competition. I, I just find that I, I really do find that astonishing that we're at the at the point where we're building custom hardware to try and keep kind of one level ahead of ahead of the competition. I find that extraordinary. Do you see the same thing on the the hedge fund side on the AI side with um, so GPUs are obviously very yeah. kind, of, kind of well known for this kind of thing. So presumably exactly. you've got hedge funds investing heavily in GPUs as well. Actually, uh, I guess everybody today working or using AI is using GPU, whether they know it or not. I, I do not know, but I, I, I may just be ignorant. Um, I do not know of a specific GPU uh, for hedge funds yet, uh, but uh, just using GPU, they're so powerful to, to uh, perform calculus uh, computation on derivatives metrics. Uh, which is exactly what you need for gradient descent and uh, uh, and backpropagation. Uh, they're so good at it that you can leverage them. Uh, even today, if you're a customer of Google or if you're a customer of um, probably all the other clouds, uh, you're going to use GPU uh, as part of their uh, AI offering. So how much of this sort of work is being done in the cloud versus in your own, in their own kind of data centers? I tend to think of the, these companies as being quite conservative about kind of exporting data off site. Is that still the case or has that changed? <laughs> conservative, yes, for a good reason, because it's uh, we're talking about uh, intellectual property that generates a lot of money. Uh, especially if you're good at it. So whether um, you, even if it costs more not to uh, host with a third party and host within a data center that you uh, master end to end, uh, the return on um, uh, on your risk will be probably better today. Now I would uh, I would think that some elements can be uh, put in the cloud. Right. Okay. And in terms of stream data itself, what's kind of next for you? What are the things that are working on? What are the things that you're excited about? Uh, it's uh, so we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna get closer to um, to Greenwich and Stanford uh, where hedge funds are. Um, I think what's exciting for us is the idea of servicing one more uh, AI companies on top of the um, um, application. Uh, builder that were using us for um, presenting real-time data. Um, the, what we're exploring right now are uh, sectors other than finance uh, using real-time data, uh, including uh, transport uh, and healthcare. Um, so yeah, tons of stuff, too much stuff. <laughs> That's very, very exciting. Um, one more question, I think. So that going going back to the hedge funds, um, the what are the kind of data sources that you're using? It's not purely market data, I'm assuming. You're no. presumably going wider than that to try and get ahead of the ahead of the curve in some way. 
So it's not stream data using them, but uh, stream data uh, offering the possibility for people to build these um, these uh, brains. So let's say you have a totally event-driven brain, which is classic now. You you know you have a Kafka belt, and and uh, you're using a, a streaming algorithm that's totally event-driven with a complex event processing as starter. Um, what you want is that that brain be fed with as much information as possible about the world surrounding it. So definitely you need some uh, market data. Um, so you can use uh, Xignite and other uh, uh, even driven uh, uh, cl uh, cloud providers for, for market data. You also need to consume uh, data about what people say about companies uh, that you can find on social networks like uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, or LinkedIn for corporate data. And then you also have uh, networks like StotTwit uh, specialized in social trading data um, with people that are experts in the area and will start commenting about uh, what they think about uh, a specific company at a specific time. Uh, you can also consume APIs specialized in providing you a sentiment uh, on specific instruments, and there are like people like Vetar, uh, SiteSignal, or STMI is specialized in it. So with that, your brain will start having a good feel of what people think about what's going on in the market, so that the, the brain can actually make a dedicated decision as if it was on the floor of all exchanges and sitting by all the analysts and uh, traders in the world having their uh, feelings about the market. So that brain will actually be smarter than anybody else. Now what's going on right now is that uh, you can start seeing people consuming unusual data like retail data um, for forecast. Like uh, if you want to forecast the sales of of a plastic manufacturer, um, it is probably a good idea of looking at how many handbags are being sold in China today. Uh, or if you're trading on meat in Chicago, uh, meat uh, futures, of course, um, it's probably a good idea to listen to what's going on in uh, Argentina on IoT sensors that are being used to, so to check the health of uh, cows in Argentina. So these unusual sources of data are actually opening um, wealth of possibilities for the brain to actually know everything that's happening uh, at a given moment in the world to make the best possible decision on whether or not it should buy or sell a specific instrument. So that is completely fascinating. So you've got a real mix of sort of sentiment analysis stuff and and. Um natural language processing and data from sensors and all sorts of things coming in. It's really, really intriguing. Yeah, oh, it is. And uh, it took, took me a while to actually understand what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> Um, and as a, it's it's got, it's an interesting contrast to HFT as well because with HFT it's essentially raw speed, isn't it? It's kind yeah. of it always feels like a bit of an arms race. That it's just who's got the, you know, who's got the fastest, who's closest to the exchange, and so on. Whereas this is much more of a kind of computer science problem in the in the traditional sense of it. I think it's really really interesting stuff. Yeah, the, it's. Let's say ten years ago, when when we were flash boys, that was all about speed and being faster, which was a uh, fun uh, for ops people, for like us. Uh, now today, it's more about uh, knowing more than others uh, every second, and uh, the your edge is is not on on speed. Your edge is on uh, how fast you can make sense of how much data. Uh, and what is your ability to build a model that's going to be smart enough to make sense out of some data that could seem uncorrelated. Right. That's brilliant. Eric, I could talk to you for hours, I think. Uh, it's been really, really interesting. Thank you so much for making the time today. And, um, um, yeah, just thank you very much indeed for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Charles. You've been listening to the InfoQ podcast, a podcast from the people behind InfoQ.com. 
Show notes from this and all the other episodes that we've recorded are available on infoq.com slash podcast. You can subscribe to the InfoQ podcast on iTunes. We also do a culture-oriented podcast called, with no prizes for originality, the InfoQ Culture Podcast. You can find that on InfoQ as well. Eric Horsney's presentation from QCon London will be published on the site shortly, so look out for that. And he is speaking soon at Jack's Finance in London. That's at the beginning of April. Thank you for listening.